many of you who grew up in church or Sunday school classes probably could quote this for us. And uh, what I want to do today is I, I kind of just share a little bit along the line of the Christmas theme, Christmas thought. Uh, why Christmas? Why Christmas? And uh, I'm going to really just basically do a couple, three word studies and share with us a couple, three definitions of words in John chapter 3. And so that we can look at that and give us a little bit of understanding of why Christmas. You know, why Christ? Why, why was Jesus uh, uh, given to us by the Father? Why was he born into this world? What did he come to accomplish? What was his purpose? And obviously we can't go into all of that, um, but that's kind of the line of thought today, is why Christmas? And what did Christ accomplish while he was here? And obviously, like I said, that's a big subject that we will spend eternity learning, but I'm going to just kind of share a couple of quick thoughts. Um, this morning, John chapter 3, verse 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And so we see there immediately that a couple of the things that the reason we're told that, Je that the Father gave Jesus, the only begotten Son, was that we would not perish and that we would have everlasting life. That we would not perish and that we would not have everlasting life. So one of the first things, those first three words there, should not perish. And again, what happens so often, we read over the Bible and we read those words sometimes and we don't stop to consider what's really being said there. What, what does he really mean, should not perish? What is he talking about there by the word perish? And it, it's probably not a word that we commonly use a lot in our everyday conversation. Uh, I don't often use the word perish. I don't know about you. It's just not something that's readily available, I guess, in my vocabulary that I use. But what does that word perish actually mean there? And uh, there was a, a lady, that, that, a young lady, that, that bought a car from uh, Parkside Island, where I worked at a while back. And that was her first name, Perish. And I remember seeing that, I thought, well, what an awful name. I mean, why would somebody name their kid Perish? And it's actually spelled P-E-R-I-S-H. I thought, that's kind of a depressing name, I would think. I mean, that's not a good thing to be Perish, uh, or to be perishing, or to be perishable. We're all perishables. That's not a good thing. But let me read you a definition of that word there, Perish. To destroy utterly. Idea is not extinction, but ruin, loss, not of being, but of well-being. Another definition that says in the New Testament instance, it never signifies cessation of existence or consciousness. It is a condition of every non-believer. So we can get a better understanding, though, of what it's talking about by looking at that word and how it's used in different settings. And that word perish, that Greek word there, is actually translated with other English words quite often. And if you remember right, and, and you hear me talk about a lot about Luke chapter 15. And Luke chapter 15, it's where the, the one sheep wanders away from the 99, and the, the shepherd goes out and finds that one lost sheep. It's where the, the lady loses her coin, and, and it's also where the parable of the prodigal son is. So there's obviously a theme that goes through that whole chapter of something being lost and then found. Um, but for example, when it talks about the one lost sheep that wanders off, it uses the same word, Greek word there. You can see that one perishing sheep. And when the sheep has come back, it's referred to as the perishing sheep. Uh, when, the, when the father in the parable, the prodigal son says, my son was once was lost, but now he's found. He's saying, my son was once perishing, but now he's found. So in those, in those settings, there we obviously see that perishing and separation seem to be the same thing. When that one sheep has gone away from the, the fold and gone away from the shepherd, it's referred to as perishing. When the prodigal son has, has wandered off, he's referred to as perishing. So the key point there is separation, if we really want to look at it. And if you think about that, imagine that, you know, you go off to a, a camping trip somewhere in the mountains, and you're out there, and you have a little child, and that little child gets lost. And you're there, and you're, you know, you got this massive search party, and everybody's coming for that child, and you're just kind of wringing your hands and think, I don't know what I'm going to do. My child is out there perishing. In other words, your child is at that time in great danger because he's, he or she is separated from you who care for them and watch over them and love them. Perishing is very easily understood in the sense of separation. That which is separated from God is perishing. When mankind fell in the garden, when he 
committed to sin and there was separation between mankind and God, then you can immediately say that that humanity was perishing. We are all born onto this planet as perishable items. Um, you know, we, we don't think about it that way, but each and every person who comes onto this planet is, in a part, it, it, is, is born into this planet and, and they begin to, to grow, but they also begin to age. They also begin to die. Each day is closer to that thing. They are in a state of perishing, a state of decline in a great degree. Anyone who is separated from God, anyone who is not born again, is perishing because they are separated from God. We understand, though, that the Bible tells us in 2 Peter 3, 9 that it's not God's will that any perish. It's not God's desire. It's not God's will. It's not God's plan. It's not God's design that anybody perish. And he very specifically uses that word, it's not God's will that any should perish. You see, the same way in the garden when man fell, when he, when he surrendered to, to temptation by Satan and came in, when he fell, God was right there with the answer. I mean, God immediately came on the scene. He immediately began to speak about the seed that was going to come and, 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 and defeat the enemy. You see, as the Bible tells us that, that Jesus was slain before the foundation of the world. Before any of that took place, God had a plan in place that, that would provide for man so that man would not have to perish. We see that through the ages, God can look down and, and he can see that, you know, what was going to take place. And, and through the, the, the telescope of, of foreknowledge, he can see the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he can see the gospel being preached and people coming to, to Jesus Christ. He can see all those things with his foreknowledge. So he, so the plan and the answer was already there in place because it's not God's will that any should perish. So provision was made for mankind that mankind would not perish perish or have to perish. The opportunity is there for mankind. And then we see that the God the Father gave Christ and, and we should have chosen this time of year to celebrate the birth of Christ. We understand by the Bible and, and that, that this probably isn't when Christ was born, but this is a time when we by tradition celebrate the birth of Christ. And so we look at that as the time when the Father gave the Son so that people would not perish. Because man and was separated from God and in a state of perishing. So God, because it's not his will, has made provision for lost mankind. You know, and, and I, I was talking to some pastors the other day, and we were sitting and talking, and, and I shared, you know, I said, you know, really, in the day and the hour that we live, this should be the greatest time for evangelism that the world's ever seen. And I said, because if you stop and think about it, 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 it how hard would it be to persuade somebody, convince them that this world's not working? I mean, have you noticed that this world's not working very well? That things are falling apart all across the globe? That everything that man has set up is failing? I mean, what government is working well? There aren't any, are there? What economy is working well? There aren't any, are there? What plans and devices of mankind are doing well right now? They're not. Everything is coming apart. Everything's been shaken. There's only one light shining, and that's Jesus Christ. And it should be the greatest time for the church to proclaim Christ and Him crucified that the world's ever seen, because surely there's nobody out there who thinks the world's doing great right now. Surely there's nobody out there that can't look at this world and think, you know what, there's a problem. There's an issue. What man has devised is failing miserably. There has to be a hope to be found somewhere else. There has to be a light in the midst of all of this darkness. There has to be something to stop this process of mankind perishing. And that is Jesus Christ. That is Jesus Christ. And, and this should be the finest hour for the church, beloved. Because the darkness is very dark. And it's not hard to see how bad it's failing right now, I don't think. But if you notice here, and we go back to that and, and look at verse 16. It, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believed in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. But should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, I've often shared with you that, you know, I, I kind of got maybe a, a, an odd way of looking at things sometimes, but, but after I was born again, I began to read the Bible and study the Bible. I would read things like that, and that's through me. The Bible talks about everlasting life. The Bible talks about eternal life. I thought, well, that's great, but aren't we all going to live forever? Isn't everybody going to live forever? We're eternal beings. Everybody's going to have eternal life if it's just how long you live. Everybody has everlasting life if it's just how long you live. The question isn't how long will you live. The question is where will you live? Everybody's going to exist forever, aren't they? I mean, the Bible teaches everybody's going to exist forever. Some are going to, to, to live in, 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 
heavenly bliss with Christ and, and others are going to live eternally separated from God in hell. But everybody's going to live forever. Nobody's going to cease to exist. So what's it talking about in the Bible when it says everlasting life? What's it talking about in the Bible when it says eternal life? What in the world does that mean? And that used to really throw me. I think, Lord, I don't understand that everybody's going to live forever. Either in heaven or hell, but everybody's going to live forever. You see, one of the things we've got to understand when we read eternal life or everlasting life in the Bible, it comes from a Greek word that is, focuses a lot more on quality of life than duration of life. There's a... a, 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 a for some reason, I don't know why, but there's a common name now that you meet with young little kids, and that's Zoe. You know, I've run across, I don't know how many little kids, little girls, what's their name? Oh, it's Zoe. I don't know why, there must be a Zoe in a movie or something. Usually when names become real popular, that's why. And I ask people, I say, do you know what that, where the name comes from? Well, no, I just thought it sounded good. Well, Zoe is a Greek word that is translated eternal life into life. I said, well, if you're going to pick a name, I guess that's a good one. But Zoe life is, it is a lot more than duration of life. Zoe life has to do with quality of life. And the best definition I know of is God's kind of life. In other words, if you believe in the works of Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ has come into this world so that men might be partakers of Zoe or the God kind of life, not just something that means we're going to get to live forever. And there's a lot more to it than that. Yes, it means you get to, to live forever with Christ, but it, you know, it, 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 that's part of our salvation, but it also implies a lot more. Zoe. Let me read the definition of that. Life in the absolute sense. Life as God has it. That which the Father has in himself, expressing all the highest and best which the saints possess in God. The God kind of life. You know, and we, I always pictured this way in, in my mind and, and before I was saved, and even after I was saved until I began to study the Word of God and, and get understanding of things. You know, I always pictured us all standing in a big long line on Judgment Day. And everybody's in a big long line and Jesus is sitting there. And when we, we get to go before Jesus and, and then he determines, you know, whether how well we've done, he looks at the books and he looks at the records and, man, you ain't doing too bad, you get eternal life. You know, you get into heaven. And some people might look at it, man, not so good, you know, sorry. You don't get eternal life. And I guess that, that concept was in my mind that eternal life was something we received on Judgment Day. And it was determined whether how well we had done. And then we received eternal life. Beloved, that's not even close. That's not even close. You receive eternal life when you're born again. You receive Zoe life when you're born again. You really receive God kind of life. That's what the new birth is, is receiving God kind of life. Amen. It's not something that happens on judgment day. You see, the Bible teaches us there's two judgment days. There's Bema and Bama. You want to be in Bema, not Bama. Bema is when we stand before God as a believer. We've already received eternal life. We've already received our salvation. We're going to be rewarded for what we've done with this life. And that's the key, and that's important that we understand that. The Bible teaches us in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and gives us a kind of a, a word picture of that. Is, you know, our works are, we stand before Christ and our works are laid before Him and, and the fire kind of burns everything that's not, that, that's not for God. And that which is left, that, that pure gold, so to speak, that is left, is what we receive our rewards for. Now, it's possibly, beloved, to be born again, to have eternal life, to live your life selfishly and to stand before Christ and to have no rewards. And it says that there will be suffering of loss on that day. So it, it's possible to do that. And it's also possible that we stand before Christ and, and we receive great rewards. But we're not standing before Christ to be determined and judged on whether or not we receive eternal life. You either have eternal life or you don't have eternal life. There's no receiving it after death. And that's something you either possess when you're, you're possessed as you're born again on this planet, or you don't possess when you die. But you receive Zoe life the moment you're born again. That's what being born again is. If you don't have Zoe life, you're not a new creation. And so it's a lot more than just how long it lasts 
and what the duration of it is. But you know, that should really affect our outlook a lot. What I just shared should really affect the way we live our life. I mean, I remember as a young child, and you'd hear people in school and that, and they would talk to you and teach you about, you know, you should invest in your future. Oh, you should. You should invest in your future. And they would tell you ways to invest in your future. You can save money. That would be investing in your future. In other words, having money for the, the proverbial rainy day. Or you could uh, invest in your future by education, by getting more education for a field you want to work in or something. And that would be an investment in your future. You can invest in your future by making business investments. And, and you can invest in your future maybe by buying stocks or what have you. I mean, there's a lot of different ways that a person can buy real estate or, you know, there's different ways that you can invest in your future. You can invest in your future by exercising. Because if you exercise today, you're probably going to be better off tomorrow. If you exercise when you're 30, you're probably going to be better off when you're 60. So you can invest in your future in a lot of different ways. But you see, as believers, we should ask ourselves a simple question. I just described to you the, the beam of seed judgment where our works are going to be laid before God and tried. I would advise you to invest in your eternity. I would advise you to live your life in such a way that when you stand before Christ, that there, there's great rewards there. I would, I would advise you to take the etern gift of eternal life that we have received and turn around and invest that in your eternity. And to live your life with your eyes focused on that eternity. And, and you'll get blessed here now. You'll get blessed tremendously. As you focus on the eternity, as you focus on the eternal things, the blessing of this life will come. But then you're going to be, have that eternity there. See, if you really break it down and just look at it real sensibly. I mean, my life here on planet Earth here in, in, in this lifetime is pretty short. If you compare it to eternity, it's real short if you compare it to eternity. It's a blink of the eye if you compare it to eternity. So why would I use all of my energy and invest everything that I have in trying to make this little blink of the eye moment good and not be mindful of the eternity that I have? Wouldn't just wisdom say, you know what, I'm going to invest in eternity and not be too concerned about this blink of the eye moment. I mean, it's kind of like going to a motel room and, and remodeling the room. Why would you do that? You're just going to be there for a few hours. You invest in your future. You invest in your eternity. And live your life accordingly. A person who is wise is going to be living for their eternal state. Amen? Does that make sense? You have so we life. Use it well. I'm going to read John chapter 5, verse 26. And just a couple more scriptures on Zoe. John 5, 26 says, For as the Father hath life for Zoe in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life for Zoe in himself. So the Father has Zoe. He gives the Son to have Zoe. And Jesus came to do what? I have come to give life and life more abundantly. I have come to give Zoe and Zoe more abundantly. Christ came, was born upon this planet to bring God kind of life, eternal life, e equality life to mankind. The Father has Zoe. He gives the Son Zoe. And the Son manifests Zoe upon this planet. You want to know a good example of Zoe life? Look at the life of Jesus and the way he walked and lived on this planet. That is Zoe life. Amen? Amen. We receive it how? Through faith. Through faith. But I want you to think about something here. And, and what I'm trying to accomplish here and sharing this with you this morning is it, for you to take a moment and, and when you read eternal life and everlasting life to focus on the fact that it's also a quality of life a lot more than duration of life. I mean, think about all the testimonies we've heard over the years. You know, if you've been a, a Christian for any period of time and you've been in church for any period of time, you've heard a multitude of people's testimonies. They stood up and maybe proclaimed to you while they were preaching or teaching or maybe just in conversation, people who have been delivered from drugs and delivered from alcohol and delivered from anger and rage and, 
and marriages miraculously restored, and, and you know, people delivered from gambling, or every possible sin you can think of. People have testified they've been delivered from it. Somewhere along the line, miraculously delivered from it. Well, what, what took place was different. They received Zoe. They received eternal life. They received God kind of life, and since they received God kind of life, then the quality or the nature of their outward life changed. Amen? You with me so far? Didn't think this was that puzzle. <laughs> oh, look at that. You see, go to Romans chapter 6. I'm going to read that to you. Listen to this real closely. Jesus didn't just come that we could live forever. He came to give us so Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism and death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Even though we should also walk in newness of Zoe. In other words, Zoe changes our walk. Zoe changes the way we live our life. You know, I, I have conversations with people all the time, and, and people who, who are, you know, maybe they, they're just born again, or maybe they're people who've been born again for a while, and they kind of really plug into church and really start growing into things of God, and growing in the Word, and growing in their understanding of things, and, and they'll start telling you how things have changed. You know, I don't like doing that anymore that I like to do. I don't like going to that place anymore that I used to like to go. I don't like this activity or I have trouble being around these certain people anymore. I don't understand what's going on, Pastor. You have received Zoe. You're growing and maturing in the things of God. And then suddenly your walk changes. Zoe, eternal life, God life, changes your walk. And if your walk ain't changing, you need to ask yourself if you receive Zoe. Because that's one of the characteristics of it. You know, a lot of people just, and I'm going to address this for just a moment. You know, there's a lot of people, and one of the concerns I have with so many people is there are a lot of people who hear the gospel. And, okay, I just have to believe that God exists. And their mind interprets that way, and they think, okay, I believe God exists. If I said some prayer, and I'm going to live my life just how it, how it is, and then when I get to, then I die, I get to have eternal life. If, if, if the life of God you receive today hasn't changed your life here, then it's, it's not there. Zoe changes our walk. Being born again changes our life. Being a new creation changes the way we live. And it, it may take a while for some people. Some people it happens quickly. Some people it takes a while. But if something inside you isn't changing your life, Zoe's not there. Hallelujah. I'm sorry if that makes you nervous, but... You know, being born again changes your life. Hallelujah. Receiving Zoe changes the quality of your life. Receiving Zoe changes your walk. Okay. The newness of life. Zoe. Jesus said, I come that they might have life. That they might have Zoe. And that they might have it more abundantly. Let's go back to John chapter 3 now. I'm moving through this quickly today. You're going to be amazed. For God, verse 17 now. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So again, I'm going to just kind of address one word here. And that's the word saved. And, and again, that's one of those words that we hear. And most of my understanding for years, before I again dug into the word of God when we began to study some of this issue, saved meant that when you die, you get to go to heaven. And you do. You do. When you die, you get to go to heaven. But the word saved means a lot more than just that. It means a lot more than just you say a prayer and put everything on hold and someday you need to see Jesus. Jesus came to accomplish more in our life than giving us a ticket to heaven. 
And, and that's why I'm kind of focusing on this this morning, just like I'm focusing on, on these words for that very reason. We understand that this applies right now, too. You know, this applies to how our life is lived today. This should affect our life right now, right here, every moment of every day. God kind of like Zoe changes our life. Changes our walk would be a better way of putting it. A change of life, a change of the quality of life on the inside of us changes our walk. And when he came to save us, he came to do a lot more than just say, okay, you said this prayer and I get to go to heaven something. A lot more is implied in that word. Let's look back at that one. That word there is one you probably heard me use quite often is sozo. So you can go home and then say, what did you learn? I learned all about Zoe and Sozo. I say, who's that? Sozo, the all-inclusive word of the gospel, gathering into itself all the redemptive acts and processes, implies deliverance, safety, preservation, healing, and soundness. Gathering into itself all redemptive acts and processes. So that word saved there means everything that God has ever done for mankind or ever will. That word saved there is that sozo. When, you remember the times when the apostles were in the boat? Jesus was sleeping. They went into a panic and you know, Master, Master, don't you care that we perish? What they're asking you in the, in the Greek word there is it, asking you save us. Sozo us. Sozo us. And they're realizing they're in the midst of a storm and they're, they're looking to be, have sozo in their life. And, and you know, we understand that Jesus stood up, peace be still, and calm the storm and all of that stuff. But they were looking for sozo. So sozo can be applied there. Jesus came so that we could be delivered from the storm. Jesus came so you could be delivered from the storms in your life. Jesus came so when you're in the midst of the battle and you're in the heat of the storm, you can cry out to Jesus and deliverance is available for you. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Bible says the Lord delivers us from them all. Sozos us from them all. Christ came so you'd be set free and delivered in the midst of the storm. Christ came so that he can rescue you in the storm. The word sozo. When, when the... Israelites were delivered out of Egypt and, and Moses led them out of there and they had that massive string of miracles that led up to the parting of the Red Sea. In Jude chapter, in Jude verse 5, it, it says that that was so-so. So that deliverance from Egypt was so-so. Jesus came that we could be delivered from the captivity. Jesus came so we could be delivered from the captivity of this world. The lady with the issue of blood who, who fought his way through the crowd and, and, and touched the hem of Jesus' garment and healing virtue ran out of him and, and made her whole. And Jesus turned to her and says, who touched me? And the apostles say, well, what do you mean? The disciples, who touched you? Everybody's talking to you. And he said, no, but I felt virtue coming out of me. And the woman stepped forth and said, you know, it was me. And he said, oh, well, you know, according to your faith, be done unto you. Your faith has made you so-so. And then when she received sozo, when she received that healing, we could go on and on and on. James chapter 5, it says, The prayer of faith shall save the sick. And prayer of faith shall sozo the sick. And I can take time and I can go into the Word of God and show you where, where all of these things that are sozo, the Word of God reveals or provided for mankind in the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Sozo, he came to us in a sozo. Here's a couple others. Matthew chapter 1, verse 21 says, And she will bring forth a son. Here's the one that a lot of people are all get wrapped up in celebrating Christmas and in the worldly sense don't quite grasp. This would make the world mad in the Christmas celebrations. She will bring forth a son. And shall call his name Jesus. For he will save his people from their sins. The world wouldn't like that. Sitting around at their Christmas party, drinking and hooping and hollering and celebrating the fact that Jesus came to deliver them from those sins. Let's celebrate that way! But it's important for us to understand, beloved. It's just not a ticket to go to heaven. Christ came to deliver mankind from sin. The old saying 
used to be. I remember in all the old Pentecostal churches, they'd always preach that. Jesus came to save you from sin, not in sin. When you're looking for deliverance from sin, then you're looking for Jesus. If you're looking for a free ticket to heaven, you're not really looking for Jesus. Because he didn't come to give anybody a free ticket to heaven. He never was born on this planet with a plan or the intention of, of, of people just saying, well, yeah, I believe in Jesus and living their life in sin and dying and going to heaven. That was not in his plans. He looked out at people who were bound up in sin and being destroyed because of sin. And he came to set them free from the power of sin. Receiving Christ is receiving deliverance from sin. Not receiving salvation in sin. A lot of Christianity has got twisted on that. And they've got this idea that grace is just saying, yeah, I believe in Jesus and living our life in sin and being okay. And that was never God's plan. Ever. He came to deliver us from sin. To break that yoke so that we could live in the newness of Zoe. Hallelujah. Not that bad. <coughs> the Apostle Paul said that the Lord will sozo him from every evil word he came against him. We know that the Bible says that Jesus came and defeated principalities and powers to set us free from the power of the enemy. That's sozo. Sozo is healing for the sick. So-so is deliverance for the vow. So-so is, 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 is deliverance from circumstances. So-so is peace in the storm. We could go on and on and on. So-so includes everything that God has ever done for mankind in any place or time. So-so is deliverance from sin. Hallelujah. You know that, that's funny how that word just makes people nervous. Yeah. You can watch it by change like it's that bad. So how, how do we receive Sozo? How Christ did all of this stuff? How do you and I receive it and partake of it? The Bible's playing on that. You go back to John chapter 3, if you're not still there. Let me share some scriptures with you. I'm just about done. I promise you. I told you it was going to be short today. Consider the gift that God has given. To deliverance for all of mankind, for all that ails him. Hallelujah. John chapter 8, let me read a couple, three verses to you. Verse number 12. If I have told you earthly things and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you heavenly things? Sounds like believing is important, doesn't it? Verse 15, for whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Sounds like believing again, doesn't it? Verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We can look down at verse 18. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son. Sounds like you're not believing again. Verse 36, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God divided upon him. There's something that the Holy Spirit just seems to keep quickening me here with, and I just want to make mention of it in conclusion. This is a real good moment to share what I just, on the foundation of what I just taught you something. I just shared, and it's been on my heart a lot lately, and I guess because of some of the conversations I've had with certain people, either in person or on the internet and stuff as of lately. Uh, but this whole idea that just believing that God exists and all is well. This whole idea that believing God exists and grace covers everything and everything's okay. It's not biblical. And what I've shared with you it is very simple and very basic. 
But it shows that simple point. It talks to you there about believing. You say, well, yeah, I believe in Jesus so all is well. It says if you believe, you receive everlasting life. If you believe, and if we have this idea in our head that when I believe everlasting life means when I die, then I get everlasting life, and I get to be with Jesus, and that's all it is is time duration, we miss the point. But if we understand if I believe I receive Zoe, I receive the God kind of life, which changes my walk and transforms me, then we have a different understanding of it. You see, that's what it's talking about there. If you believe, then you receive Zoe. And Zoe is not just duration, but it's also the quality of life and the nature of the walk that we walk. And that's important for people to understand of it. And that's what the Bible is talking about. When we truly place our faith in Christ. Let me explain this. Let me appoint the Lord to put me in faith today because God is saying he's raised it up. You have to be assured that the object of your faith is correct. And you have to be assured that the Jesus you say you believe in is a Jesus as he's revealed in the Bible. There's a lot of people who will tell you they believe in Jesus, but they don't believe in the Jesus as revealed in the Bible. And there's cults that will tell you, oh, I believe in Jesus too. And, you know, when those particular cults approach me, I have always got one response. I believe Jesus is God. Do you? Well, no, they don't. They believe he's an angel. See, they don't believe in Jesus as defined by the Bible. They use the name Jesus, but they supply their own definition. You with me so far? You can use the name and supply your own definition and be wrong. I can say Jesus and then supply my own definition rather than the biblical definition and not have the proper object of my faith. I just created something in my thoughts and imagination that I think Jesus is. And then I'm not truly putting my faith in Jesus. Does that make sense? Uh huh. Now, if I have faith in an object and I use the name Jesus, and this Jesus is that I define is somebody who says, okay, I, you just believe I exist, you live how you want, and that's what grace is, and you get to spend eternity with me, I'm truly not believing in Jesus. Because that's not who he is. Because Jesus, as I just read to you in scriptures, that we are to believe in to receive Zoe, eternal life, is a Jesus that came to deliver us from sin. You know, and one of the things I look back at in my life, one of the greatest things that, I, that I'm so grateful for that I understood when I came to Christ, I didn't know much, but I understood when I came to Christ, I was coming to the one who was delivering me from sins. And I was not looking to continue living my life that way. So to believe in Jesus, we need to believe in the one who came to set man free from sin. Because that's who he is defined by the Bible. And then we receive Zoe, and Zoe changes the quality of our life. But there's a lot of people, beloved, who have this image of Christ as someone who just died for them and shed their blood for them, and they gotta believe it exists and live how they want, and then they get to spend eternity with Jesus. And God forbid, I think there's a lot of people who are sitting in churches where they're standing up behind the pulpits and telling them that. But if you believe in the Jesus of the Bible, you come to a Jesus, and we see the Jesus who comes to save you free from the power of sin and right? That's who Jesus is. That's who the Father came to the world. The promise was a son would be born that would deliver his people from sin. So how can you receive the one who comes to deliver you from sin and think it's okay to live in sin? That doesn't make sense, beloved. And I'm sorry. If that offends people, but that's worth Hallelujah. Aren't you glad, though? I'm glad that when I was in the depths of addiction, there was a Jesus who had died to deliver me from it. I'm so glad that the Jesus I came to didn't just pat me on the back and say, oh, it's well. You know, see you see in a few years. I'm glad that I came to a Jesus who sets me free. And I'm glad that when I struggle with some area in life today, I can go to a Jesus who sets me free. 
And I'm glad for the battles and struggles that I have with sin, that I come to a Jesus that not only forgives me, but cleanses me and changes me and transforms me and delivers me. I don't want a Jesus that don't deliver me from sin. I don't want Jesus who just pats my head to see you in eternity. But beloved, that's what people, I mean, I'm sorry, but that's what a lot of people seem to be getting an image of lately. That's not Jesus. That's an idol that people have created with their imagination and their thoughts. The Jesus, the real Jesus, is a Jesus that's revealed in his word. And anything else, and, and, and in the book of Galatians, Paul told them that. The Galatian church, he says, if the Jesus you're preaching is another Jesus, and it's another gospel. It's not even the real Jesus. So praise God. I didn't know I was going to go in that direction. It gets so heavy there for a minute. But the Holy Spirit kept leading me and directing me into that. For some reason. So receive it as such. Amen? Amen. Yeah. And uh, I don't know quite what to do now. Hallelujah. Give me kind of keyboard for a moment. Hallelujah.